Peggy Farron, and we're live with the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel and nature photography. We are so honored to have the very famous Arthur Morris as our first guest. Now, if you don't know who Artie is, you've been living under a rock. Artie Morris is the world's premier bird photographer. He's also one of the top nature photography educators in the world. He has earned the prestigious title of Canon Explorer of Light, which there are, I don't even know, there's a handful of photographers from all over the world who have earned that prestigious title. Arthur's book, The Art of Bird Photography, is basically considered the Bible for bird photographers. So thank you, thank you so much for being our first guest. Thank you for having me. It's exciting to be here. It's exciting for us, too. We'll see how long my voice lasts. I know. All right. We'll, we'll turn your mic up. <laughs> All right. So, so tell us about Arthur Morris. Okay. Now, you started, you were a school teacher, driving a cab part-time? Drove a cab, then got a job in PS106 in Brooklyn. Wow. Taught there for 23 years. Wow. And... When I was two or three, I was brought to Keyport, New Jersey. Okay. And when I was 11, 12, 13, my great uncle Frank and my aunt Alice, we used to call her Lala, they would come to Brooklyn. This is before the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Uh -huh. And they would pick me up on a Friday afternoon and take me back to Keyport, where Lal's mother lived. So she was my great aunt. I'm terrible with. I don't know either. With relatives. She yeah, was my great, great something. Because Lal and Frank were my great aunt and my great uncle, great uncle and aunt. Okay, okay. And there I got interested in snakes and bugs, <laughs> and I collected butterflies. And this is when you were a little kid? I was 13. Okay. And the funny part is I was running around Marine Park in Brooklyn with a butterfly net, <laughs> and I thought that bird watching was for sissies. Oh my gosh. And the local hoods were throwing rocks at me and calling me all sorts of names. So that was my introduction to nature, thanks to Lal and Frank. Oh my gosh. So how did that trans... Okay, so then you went to college, you became a teacher. Da 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 da. I used to love sports. I loved three man basketball. I played golf. I was a captain of Brooklyn College golf team. We weren't very good. And when I got in a tournament, I would choke. Oh. I was so bad. I got so nervous. Oh my god! I used to feel like my el my elbows would turn to jelly. That's so funny and because now you work so well under pressure. <laughs> uh, so, and I played a lot of three man basketball all through my twenties. Okay. And then in the early thirties, my left knee got really bad, and my back started bothering me, and I was much heavier. Okay. And I was looking for something to do where I could get outdoors uh -huh. and go for a walk at least. So I sent for my father's, I knew he had some binoculars from the war. He was in the war in the Pacific, but he wound up with a pair of German binoculars. And they were so smacked up that if you looked at them for more than a minute, you'd get a headache that lasted two weeks. You know, they were out of collimation. Oh my God. But I started fussing around and looking at a few birds. And then a bunch of little seeds were planted to make me become a bird watcher first. Okay. But then it was bird watching. Now it's birding. Oh, I see. No longer bird watching. <laughs> and seven years of birding. Really? Seven all in New years? York City. And I had seen about, I don't know, more than 300 species of birds. And there's only about 370 or something that come through New York City. I so I'm starting to get a little bored. Yeah, you don't think of New York City as a mm, place to go birding. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of great birds in New York City between Central Park and Jamaica Bay. Really? Okay. It's amazing, yeah. All right, so you're so, not bored. So there were two local guys. One of the name was Thomas H. Davis, Jr. Okay. He was six foot nine, hundred. 40 pound guy worked for the phone company. Oh my gosh. And he had this gigantic lens called a Novaflex where you had it on a gun stuck and you actually focused by moving it in and out. And he was a sort of mysterious guy. And I would follow him around and he would never even talk to me. And then after about three years of studying shorebirds, he saw that I was serious. Oh. And I was walking by him on the pond and he said, Hey, Artie, how's it going? And I went, Oh my God, Tom Davis talked to me. <laughs> This is friggin' amazing. 
and I got down on the ground and I drew diagrams in the, in the, in the mud. How do you tell a bared sandpiper? And he was kind and nice and sweet. And I went home and I told my, now my former wife, Dana, I can't believe it, Tom Davis talked to me. I'm like the luckiest person in the world. And the next week I saw him. Didn't talk to you. Two ships passing <laughs> in the night. And then it gets a little sad after that. Oh. Tom, Tom suffered a cerebral aneurysm at age 39 and passed away. He was quadru hemiplegic for a couple of years and then eventually died. Oh, how sad. But he loved the shorebirds. They took him on a stretcher twice to see the redneck stint that I found on the East Pond, which was the first one for New York State. Oh. And he got it on the second time. And then there was another guy named Tony Manzoni. Okay. Eastern European guy, walked around with, in the summer, like today, 100 degrees, and he'd have a big corduroy coat on, and he had a mirror lens. And I went to see his slide program, and I was like, oh my God. And I remember one picture in particular, Elise Bittern. Uh -huh. I said, oh my God, I want to do that. So wow. I did. So now did you take classes, or? Oh yeah, I'm the big story for photographic education. I took a course given by New York City Audubon in February of 1984. Okay. Eight Tuesday nights for two hours. So that's my sole photographic training. Really? Yeah, and then Milton Heiberg, who taught the course, turned out to be a lifelong friend. and was, He lives in Orlando now, so we see each other once in a while. So did he, like, mentor you, or did you kind of hook on to him? Uh, my memory is me getting on the ground and begging him, Milton, please teach me exposure. <laughs> and he made a great living photographing books and Campbell's soup cans, you know, oh, okay. in a studio. Uh -huh. But I couldn't understand what he was telling me about how to get the right exposure. So that was a journey with film that took about 13 years for me to really figure out. Exposure? Just exposure. So the people who are doing digital today, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> It's hard time way with too easy. Too. I, I way had a too hard easy. Time learning. But you know what? I'm not a technical person. And I love the art of photography, but the technical part drives me crazy. So that's I do okay with the technical part. But the technical part. But what I like to say is that, as far as how a camera works or how light goes through a lens, George Lepp knows more in one fingernail clipping than I could ever hope to know. <laughs> so I'm I'm more of a seat of the pants. Go out and do it. Let's and see the results. I've never tested a lens. I've never tested a camera. I don't go for this dynamic, the fancy charts that they do. Right. And There's the sharpness. Take a picture. My experience is if I hold the camera still and the lens and I focus correctly, the picture's going to be sharp. Yeah. But you know what? You learn from experience. Experience is the best teacher, really. A, a combination of both is probably best. I got so, 33 years of that. And yeah, the more, you know, as you know, Joe Fitzpatrick is my technical side. And uh, one Hi, time, Joe. Yeah, Joe's back there. Hey, <laughs> anyway, one time I knew something that he didn't know because I had more experience in that area. I was so excited because <laughs> he knows That's everything. like me. I've learned Photoshop from a dozen great people. Oh, yeah. So I come off as this big Photoshop expert, and we have our digital basics file. We'll talk about that at some point. And in my whole life, I figured out about three new things in Photoshop on my own. But I'm very proud of those three. But yeah. I'm not an experimenter. I just, you know, I benefit from a lot of people yeah. who've been kind to me. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of people who, like you, who are willing to share and help and teach other people, and we're all interested. So. I still I want to hear this transition. So you're working full time as a teacher. So I'm teaching in New York City, and <clears throat> I start photographing in 1983. Okay. Inspired by Tom Davis and Tony Manzoni, I go out and I buy a lens. I have no idea what I'm doing. The first pictures that I take, I get the film back, and there's these little specks. Today we would call them dust spots. Oh, okay. Those were the birds. Ah. <laughs> so within a year I figured out that I needed to get down in the mud at Jamaica Bay and crawl up because I just had a 400 millimeter lens with film, 400 millimeter, eight power. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to get 10 feet away from a Lee Sandpipe or you're not going to get a good picture. Yeah. So I did that and I was really getting into it. So you were just doing this 
nights and weekends. Just photographing every spare minute. I was nuts. I would get up before work. When I was doing the birding for seven years, I would get up and go to Jamaica Bay for an hour and then run to make it to clock in at 8.40. Oh, my gosh. And then after school, go out. There were times we, I taught on the Brooklyn Queens border in, in a ghetto called Bushwick. And there were times, especially when I was birding, those first seven years, where I would have a prep period, a free period next to lunch, and I would get in my car and go to Forest Park in May, hope, hoping for a wave day oh with God. warblers. So I was nuts, but I mentioned that to you before, that everything I've ever done in my life, you if I was going to do it, it I'm going to do it as good as humanly possible for me. Wow. And if not, let's get on to the next thing. And one of the funnier parts is that most of my hobbies, up until I got into birding at age 33, and then started photographing at age 37, I guess started birding at on I was about 30. Okay. Almost everything went in seven year cycles, bowling and golf and fishing. So when I started photographing and when I was 37 years old, I figured out oh, the last seven years. A little more than that now. How'd that work out? <laughs> So it's been a lifelong passion. It's interesting because that is one of the questions. So we have a lot of questions from, from Arthur's blog, uh, from Facebook. A lot of people ask questions, and I kind of summarized them all. But a lot of them were, you know, what keeps you interested? What keeps you passionate about the birds? Or about the bird photography? I mean, the birds are amazing. They're beautiful. The Sandpipers, which is my favorite group, Forget if this was, I think this is the first book that I did, Shawbird's Beautiful Beachcombers. It's been out of print. We have a few copies. And the Shawbirds have always been my first love. And one of the things I love about them, they fly from one end of the earth to the other. Pectoral sandpiper breeds, <clears throat> some of them in Siberia, and they winter in the Argentine pampas. Oh my God. And there's a whole bunch of species like this. And a lot of them are going from Alaska down to South America. And then as the year, you know, when they're hatched, they have little down. And then within a month, they grow their feathers and they have a beautiful coat of feathers. So my, one of my favorite things in the world to do is get to Jamaica Bay in mid-August, which I was blessed to get, be there again this year. Okay. And you want to have a certain tide in the bay, even though the East Pond itself is not tidal. So the birds are forced into the pond at high tide. And I was there. I, pro I, kept, I, I prolonged my Long Island visit by a good couple of weeks so I could be there on August 16th and 17th. And that was because you were watching the I tide. wanted to see the baby shorebirds okay. that just got there in the beautiful fresh plumage. And I had two magical mornings. So. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So then by the late 80s, I was trying to sell some photographs through Vireo, Visual Resources for Ornithology and at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, and just doing the old thing that used to work, going in every bookstore, writing down the publisher, writing them letters, sending them samples, okay. and trying to sell a few pictures until I finally had this great realization, geez, if I'm going to try to sell one picture to go with your article, and it's nearly impossible, why don't I just write an article and ah. sell five or six pictures? Duh. <laughs> so I started doing that. <clears throat> so you started writing? I started writing. In college, they always told me, oh, you're a great writer. I would just write. And part of the reason that I was always a good writer is when I was like 11, 12, 13, I was a relentless reader, just like my two daughters. Just take out a stack of books on Friday afternoon and by Sunday, Mommy, we have to go back to Grand Army Plaza Library because I read all of them. Oh, my gosh. And then secondly, which I'm sure all listeners have figured out by this time in the interview, I love to yak. I love to tell <laughs> stories. So when I write something or do a blog post, it's really a matter of transcribing it from my brain because I've already told the story 38 times, sometimes in the middle of the night to myself. So I started sending in articles and... I wrote my first article, I 
think it was called Muddy Recollections about the East Pond. Okay. And I sent it to Birdwatcher's Digest, and the editor then was Mary Beacom Bowers, a wonderful Southern lady who's a friend to this day. And she sent me back a note. She didn't know me from Adam, and she said, oh, we promised to publish your article. So for two years, I would get my Birdwatcher's Digest and oh. open it. No. No. Two years? Two years. That's uh, six to They did, I think it was bi-monthly. So that was 12 issues. No byline, no Arthur Morris, no pictures. Uh. Then I went to Cape May, New Jersey. Okay. Actually, I messed up the story. Go back a tiny bit. Okay. I never bugged her. I never wrote her a letter and said, hey, why don't you do this? Right. So what I did was I wrote a second article, and I sent it to her. She published that article first. The next issue, she, pu she published the original article. Ah. And then over a period of about four or five years, I had art and a Birdwatcher's Digest article in almost every issue for four or five years. So I have a question about I want to that. tell okay. one more thing. Okay. When I met Mary for the first time in Cape May, she said, Artie, I want to tell you, I admire your determination so much. I kept your article for two years, and most people would be calling me on the phone and complaining, and you never said a word. And what did you do? You sent me a second article. And so she was impressed by that. She was impressed by that, and then we went, uh, we went off from there, and then, then I wound up doing a, a big one for Birders World. That was the big, beautiful magazine. They've sort of not, yeah. as be not as beautiful as it was, but again... Did you initiate that, or did they ask you? No, nobody initiates anything. Okay. As a matter of fact, one of my biggest tips back in the day when you could actually sell photographs and articles was, you know, if you read a book on how to be a professional nature photographer, they'd all tell you, write a query letter with an interesting idea and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's bogus. Right. Write the article, send them a tightly edited submission, uh -huh. and your chances just went up 95%. So that's how I did it in the beginning. Wow. And that's how I got into Birdwatcher's Digest, into Bird, Birdwatcher's Digest first, and then Birders World. And Mary was so kind to help me with my writing. And Julie Riddle at Bird Watcher, at Birders World, and another lady, Mary Catherine Parks, were so helpful. So they would, you mean they would critique your Yeah, your I would writing? send them an article. I remember the first one I did for Birders World was called No Reason to Hide, mm -hmm. because in the UK and Europe, everybody photographed birds from a hide. Oh, 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 okay. And I say no reason to hide, just crawl through the mud, you can get right up there close to them. Ah. Good so title. I, <laughs> so I did the article, and I remember Mary Catherine Parks. She said, "Artie, did you see how you started that article? Mm -hmm. I was lying in the mud, ten feet away. At least Sandpiper slept." She said, "Try to write more of those personal anecdotes and intersperse them in the rest of the text." Okay. So I did, and that article was published. So that that was a great, you know, great breaks in the beginning. But like all of my great breaks. They came from the same you started source. Them. You started your Busting own your hump. Yeah. And refusing to take no for an answer and not wanting to give up. Yeah, that because that is one of the questions in here. So what then, are some of your big breaks? So, so then we'll come back to that in a sec if that's okay. Yeah. So then by ninety one, ninety two, my first marriage had ended and I wound up with my best friend, the love of my life, Elaine Belsky. And I'm going, Elaine, we got to get out of here. I want to try to be a professional photographer. And she was like a little nervous at first. And then she had a top class. We were in Bushwick in the ghetto. Okay. And it was April, I think, of 91. And she says... <clears throat> I taught them this concept in math on Monday, and I said, does everybody understand it? Yes. And I gave them a quiz, and they all got zero. And then I retaught it on Tuesday and gave them a quiz. Does everybody understand it? Yes. They all got zero. And so on until Friday. And I taught it, and I taught my heart out. And I said, does everybody understand it? Do you have any questions? No. And I gave them a quiz, and they all got zero. Oh, boy. Let's get out of here. Oh, she had it. You want to be here? <laughs> <laughs> so... 
Then we made plans, and then it's just miracle after miracle. We decide we're going to get a sabbatical. So we put in applications to get two sabbaticals of the same year. 70% okay. pay. Ooh. Only problem was, Mary Ann Glantz was senior to Elaine by about one and a half days, you know, just based on her date of appointment. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and we had 39 people on staff, and you got 5% sabbaticals. So 5% of 39 is 1.95, whatever. Lynn Cordero said, only one of you is going to get it, and Mary Ann was entitled to it. And then, thank God, Mr. Forgetful, even going back all those years, I forgot to, to sign my sabbatical application. And the school secretary, Lynn Cordero, called me down and said, Artie, you forgot to sign your application, but it doesn't matter because we only have thir She said, oh, my God. We just got assigned this guidance counselor two days a week, but she's on our payroll. So now we have 40 or 41, and that comes out to 2.05, so they rounded up to three sabbaticals. Congratulations. Ah! <laughs> so we, we had this wonderful trip. We bought a little motorhome. We went twice around North America. We wound up at Point Pelee doing the oh warblers, and we came home. On June 30th of 1993, and if anyone would have, would have told me on that day that three days later that Elaine was going to find a lump in her left breast and be dead in 15 months, I would have fallen off my chair laughing. That would have been the stupidest story I ever heard, because I'm blessed. My children all have ten fingers and toes. My parents are alive. Where would you come up with a story like that? Wow. But that's what happened. And I miss her to this day. She was just oh my God, thank God you the had that, sweetest that trip. nine years wow. with just the most wonderful woman on the planet, loving and accepting and my best friend. We were like two old gloves. Oh. I mean, near, even near the end, we'd be walking and holding hands and people would say, cut that out. Oh. Oh. But she was a great friend. Wow. So now did you go back to work when you got back? Well, the plan that, I mean, was... Back to teaching? The plan was to take the sabbatical. Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot to tell you another great part. Mr. Story. Albert Shanker, the infamous labor leader uh -huh. for uh, American Federation of Teachers, or United Federation, UFT, United Federation of Teachers. In 1974 or 5, when I was laid off, Al Shanker loaned New York City $9 billion dollars from the teacher's pension funds. Oh. One of the givebacks that he got was that if for people who took a sabbatical between 1990 and 1995 could take their sabbatical, mm -hmm. get paid 70% of their pay, get rested, re-energized, and re-educated, okay. and go back to the school and go, bye. Seriously? So we were allowed to leave off of our sabbaticals. Oh, my God. So that was great while it lasted. Unfortunately, Elaine needed a health sabbatical. We had enough years that she was able to get a half-year sabbatical. And then uh, we went to Hawaii in October of uh, 1994 with her son Mitchell uh -huh. and I think his girlfriend Sally at the time. And then we came home and Elaine basically... You know, even in death, she was blessed in that. I mean, I've heard nightmare stories with breast cancer of pain and hallucinations. Lane lost five pounds and went to sleep. Wow. So she was blessed there. And she was so amazing even in death. The last week, people are calling up, and she's consoling them. Aww. And she would say, what do I have? to be sad about. I had the most amazing life and you were the best part of it. Aww. And she, she was amazing. Yeah. And then one of the coolest things, her, her, her dad and Dave Goldstein, her father was the spiritual leader of, of Temple Deltona mm -hmm. and Dora Goldstein was her mom. They lived till 86 and 92 respectively. Wow. And I forgot what the hell I was going to say. <laughs> that happens to me. Oh, my God. <laughs> anyway, oh, at the funeral, Dave conducted a ceremony to bury his daughter, never shed a tear. Wow. 
in the, in the synagogue, I couldn't even speak. I was such a wreck for seven years, but that's a whole other story. But one of the most gratifying things in my life was Dave is doing the eulogy and he's going, oh, and Elaine was a little girl and she was good and she met Marvin and they were married and they had Mitchell. She went to Brooklyn College and blah, but nothing prepared her for the happiness she would come to know with Arthur. Aww. And that's with Elaine's first husband sitting there in the audience, wow. so that was special. Wow. Back to photography. Okay, yeah, that was, you're going to get me all choked up. <laughs> All right, so did you go back to... We didn't have to teach. You, so you didn't have to go back to... We were to done. Were you making money as a photographer by then? It's a crazy story. I was making some money, but Elaine left... I, I had a nice inheritance from Elaine's money. Okay. In a way, it was lucky she died before 55, because if she lived to 55 and gotten one pension check in New York City, the system is... You get no more, not another cent. But I got a nice amount of money, and I had to decide whether I want. I, I was going to put it in an IRA, and I had to decide if I wanted to take out. They had just passed the new law. If you want to take some money out, you have to specify the amount in advance, and you have to take it out every month for ten years, and you can never change your mind. Oh, geez. So I figured I better take some money out. Okay. Turned out it was the stupidest thing I ever did, but I was doing the best at the time because I wound up. You know, when we first, when I was first going through that period of, I want to be a professional nature photographer specializing in birds, <clears throat> what should I do? Talk to family, talk to friends, talk mm -hmm. to other bird people. Oh, you can't make a living photographing birds. It's too specialized. Uh, you'll never do it. There's just no money there. And then probably within five years of that, after Lane's death, we had our best year ever, and we took in over $950,000. Wow. Okay, so I'm jumping around because this I had this all nice and organized, but I get questions immediately. So, okay, so that was 1998 or something like that, right? No, 20 we, years ago? We finished, or Elaine died in 94, so we just got the last of her money, okay. of her last sabbatical money, and then I was on my own. But I was getting a decent check from the IRA. Okay, so what? But then I started making money. Don't ask me how. Well, it was what, totally that different. Is, that is a different what, world. That is what, that's one of my questions is, okay, what, <clears throat> how did you make money 15, 20 years ago as opposed to how do you make money now? As 20 a, years ago, you could actually sell a photograph. Okay. In, in tax year 2001, we sold or leased the rights for more than $220,000 worth of images wow. to book, mostly to book projects. Okay. Somebody buys 120 pic pictures at 75 bucks each and it adds up ah. and doing a lot of writing and the whole bit. And now with digital, everyone can take a picture. It's so easy. There's a ton of great photographers out there who out of ignorance, perfect example is this iBird app. I used to, it's, it's a little thing that goes on your phone with bird songs, and they have a picture oh, okay. of each bird. Mm -hmm. So I forget the name of the guy who used to do it, but I used to make a lot of money every year through Vireo because he paid a decent price for each usage. Uh -huh. And if they reprinted, you know, they bought the rights for 20,000 CDs, and if they printed another 10,000, you got another check for each picture. Right. So there was some sanity and fairness. Right. Then along came the guy iBird now. A lot of people are bitter. I tip my hat to the guy. I got the email just like everybody else. Dear Mr. Mars, we want to use your pictures on our iBird. We can't pay you anything, but we'll give you a credit and everybody will call you to buy your pictures. Mm. <laughs> I said, no, that don't quite work for can't, me. You can't eat. So a lot of great photographers gave their pictures for free. Yeah. Not one of them has ever sold a picture because no. you need a microscope to see their credit line, and there's a thousand pictures, and that all pretty came close to putting the original guy out of business. Of course, you know he was selling his product for eighty-nine bucks, and this guy could sell it for fifteen. Right. That guy wound up buying a house on Sanibel for cash. Yeah. Oh you know, my. in fi in fifteen minutes. Yeah. So you yeah. know the business has changed. Now you the last time we checked probably three years ago, that number of $220,000 was 
was below $20,000. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, I'm not working as a greeter in Walmart, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm not flipping burgers. You're still. So in those 15 years, I like to say, hey, I'm just a Jewish kid from Brooklyn, but I have a halfway decent head on my shoulders. And one of the huge things was, well, let's go back a little bit. In 98, we published uh, hold this down so it doesn't... The Art of Bird Photography. Okay. And do you want to touch on how that came to be? Yes, let's do it. That's one of our questions anyway. That was, that's why I figured... This came 1990? 1998. 1998, okay. So I'm and sure this, you'll... And let me just, before you go, this truly is considered the Bible for bird photographers. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. Tell us how it came to And be. this is the follow-up Bible that nobody knows about, but we'll talk about that in a minute when we get done with this. I'm ready. <laughs> so... <clears throat> I'm getting published regularly in Birdwatcher's Digest and Birders World, and I get this idea, I want to do a book on bird photography. So I looked around, and I saw this wonderful series by a publisher called Amphoto, okay. and the one that stuck in my mind was John Shaw's The Nature Photographer's Guide to Professional Field Techniques. Okay. And I said, I want to do a book just like that for bird photography. So I got the name of the, the editor of Amphoto, mm -hmm. and I, I think Joe McDonald had told me that they just, Amphoto just did a book on bird photography. Okay. That my chances were slim. So, oh God, I can't think of the lady's name. It'll come to me in a minute. So I called her up, Robin Simmon. Okay. The brain is a strange thing. You have a good memory for names. <laughs> Let me tell you, that one was totally gone, and then it's there. How it works, I don't know. So I call her up in December, mm -hmm. and I go, hey, Robin, my name is Arthur Morris. I want to do a book on bird photography. I know you did, a, I know you did one, but we can do a much better one. Okay. Never return my uh, phone call. Okay. okay. So then I went to a NAMPA, North American Nature Photographers Association, meeting in San Diego probably in 97. Okay. Sort of before cell phones. Yeah. When you used to need quarters. Yeah. Okay. For a pay phone. Right. I, I so I go there. down <laughs> I go down in the basement of this big convention hotel. Uh-huh. It's lined for the phone. I turn around. And then her name tag Rob Robin Simmon am ah. photo. I go, "Hey Robin, I, I left you a phone message in December. You never called me back. Oh, I've been so busy. I'm so sorry. What's uh -huh. it about? I want to do a bird photography book. She goes, great. We just did a bird photography book. It's the worst book ever. People are calling us up telling it that they should get a refund. Oh. I said, bingo. Oh, my God. And I said to her, I said to her right there on that line for the phone, I said, we will remember this moment because probably within a year, you're going to be holding this book in your hand and saying, wow, we just met at the phone, on the phone line. Wow. So, now, did you already have the book <clears throat> written? No, the book wasn't written. Did you have an idea? You had an idea, of course. Yeah. But nothing. I'm nothing trying to done. think. Actually, I had done a little booklet for Birdwatcher's Digest okay. called Bird Photography Basics. Okay. And... It was just a short pamphlet, but I was proud when I met Roger Tory Peterson at an event in Connecticut. He stood in front of the group and he said, this is the greatest booklet you'd ever want to see. Oh. Arthur Morris will teach you more in 70 pages than, than I've learned in the last 40 years about oh, photography. Wow, that is nice. So we actually used that on the back of the, uh, what was first the hardcover book, and then m more long stories on this one. Yeah, let's see. Do, 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 do. Arthur Morris teaches you in 40 pages what it took me 40 years to learn. Roger Tory Peterson. And then another guy, Bill Thompson III, who had taken over as editor of BWD, Bird Rush's Digest, he was the only person who encouraged me in the industry. You mean to write the book? No, or just to be general. a bird photographer. Oh, okay. He said to me, Artie, you can write. 
you're funny, your photography's great, you're a great teacher, your people skills need a little work. <laughs> and he was right. He said, but if anybody's going to make it, it's going to be you. So the quote he gave us for the back of the book, has few peers when it comes to the art of bird photography. Some people are born to use their talents in a given field of endeavor. Artie was born to be a bird photographer. Thank you, Billy. And then I could go off and spend three hours on stories about Billy and Julie Zikafus, the artist, and how they met, but then we'll never finish anything. <laughs> so the book came to fruition. And you know, that was a huge break. One funny part is that <clears throat> Robin sent me a note at one point after I sent her the text which I had gone over with a fine tooth time a hundred times and had 38 different friends read it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the text was perfect. And I sent it to them and she said, oh, by the way, I'm not going to be editing this book. This young lady is, she just got out of college 15 minutes ago. Mm. She knows nothing about photography. Oh, great. So she took a red pencil to the manuscript, made about 3,000 changes, found two spelling errors. Oh. The other 2,998 reverted back to the original text but I had to explain to them why what they wrote was stupid. And then I was forced to thank her in the, <laughs> in the forward, which I did. So the book came out oh. and you know, it was a dream to do a beautiful book. I gave a signed copy to John Shaw. Oh. And my friend Robert Volani, we started in New York City about the same time with the late Tom Vizo. And he always used to say, I'd call him up and go, I got this great shot. And he'd go, show me the picture. You know, Mr. Negative. Oh my gosh. So I sent him, him a copy of the book and I said, here's the pictures, Rob. <laughs> he wound up two, doing two great books. Oh, he did too? He did, yeah. He did a book, two great books for Harry and Abrams, one on Baxter State Park and one called The Natural History of Long Island. And I freaked a couple of months ago when I'm watching some news clip of Obama uh -huh. sitting in the White House talking to the press uh -huh. for something. Uh -huh. And there's Rob's book on his coffee table. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. I was looking for the art of bird photography. I know, where was yours, dang it. <laughs> well, when he retires, he'll, he'll so take that, that was the So <laughs> that was 98, and that really put me on the road. That Elaine had been gone four years. And then right about that time, <clears throat> I met a guy named Dave Metz from Cannon. Okay. And how did you meet him? It was at... Uh, like a convention or? At a, I think at an Outdoor Writers Association convention. Oh, okay. Which I joined and quit. And I went up to him, I knew he was with Ken. I said, hey Dave, you gotta help me out here. I'm publicizing all your gear and stuff to my clients. And he was like, don't bother me, kid. Maybe we'll do something. So a couple of months went by and I'm always gonna take the initiative. I'm not gonna give up. So I sat down and I wrote him a letter I said, Dear Dave, please send me a Canon 600mm f4 image stabilized lens and the latest Canon film body, I guess a 1D, I don't know, uh -huh. as a thank you for my longtime support of Canon <laughs> USA. <laughs> Chutzpah. So I bring it to the post office and I had some slides. We used to send out slides in priority mailboxes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Send them out. I come back in the time of fax machine and there's this fax pages, 45 pages spewing all over my little office on, on uh, Whitewood Drive in Deltona. Oh my God, we're, inv we're inviting you to become one of the f first 55 explorers of light in this new program. Oh my God. So I said, oh my God. And I ran back to the post office and I knew the guys there because oh we were going gosh. every day and I said, Hey, I gave you that letter two hours ago. Can you get it back for me? <laughs> and he said, no, it's already out on the truck. <laughs> oh, my God. So the program was started by a guy named Mike Newler. Mm -hmm. He's long gone from Canon and then taken over. Uh, Dave was the boss for a while, Dave Metz, and then Stephen and Gleema. And those guys were just wonderful to me. Now, did, when Dave got your letter, did he... Uh... No, he was cool about it. As a matter of fact... <laughs> Very soon after that, Dave Metz twisted some arms mm -hmm. and they got $30,000 back that they had donated to the Nature Conservancy. You know, a lot of money, I'm talking 
a lot of zeros. Okay. But they got them to redirect $30,000 to support my first exhibit, which was at the Roger Tory Peterson Institute. Wow. So he was good to you. They've been, all been great. Wow. And they'll be sponsoring tomorrow's talk. Wow. And we'll just do, we'll do a quick commercial right here. If you are in Southwest Florida tomorrow at 9 a.m. Saturday, September 10th, Artie is going to be doing a three-hour talk. And what's the, the title of the talk? A Bird Photographer's Story. A Bird Photographer's Story. Um, it's, it's sponsored by our local camera club. I'm going to give you, it's, it's Digital Photography Imaging Special Interest Group. And we're going to have the link, the website, in the show notes on understandphotography.com shortly after this show ends. All right, I want to get to some technical pro questions because we've got a lot of them. I'm not very good at that. <laughs> I, think you're going to, I think you're going to be pretty good at these. Um, we have a lot of, well, actually, let's just start with equipment. I have two, two big questions, just general questions. First one <laughs> is to be like a really good bird photographer, what, do you, what kind of equipment do you need? What do you need? You need... A good camera, a good lens, you need a good tripod. Do you have the any biggest specific lesson, suggestions? The biggest lesson for everybody, Okay. and I'm sure whatever you guys specialize in, you know, people photography or weddings or whatever. corporate or whatever. Our audience is very... The biggest good. lesson is for everybody who wants to get better uh -huh. is that going out and buying the most expensive camera body and the most expensive lens does not do anything to make you better. Did you ever consider maybe trying to learn to use the gear that you have and learn the principles that make good, good images? So, I mean, there's a, I'm, I'm a co-founder and now a co-owner of a site called birdphotographers.net, which is an educational critiquing site. Oh, okay. But it ain't just birds. In addition to Avian Forum, we have uh, landscapes and Eager to Learn and Macro and Wildlife. So it's a really great place for nature photographers to learn. Okay. When and I took tell my, me, tell when me the I, website again. Birdphotographers.net. Okay. Go ahead. So I'm so bad. All right. So it's a critiquing site? Yeah. You put you the, members, the members post an image 1,200 wide less than 400 kilobytes, and then the moderators okay. and the participants, the members, uh -huh. will comment on your picture. And it's a membership site? So it's a membership much, site. How much does it cost? I think it's 40 bucks a year. $40 for the whole year, that's it? Yeah, but here's the coolest thing. I should have mentioned when I took that one nature photography course with Milton Heiberg, uh -huh. the best part of the, the whole course was the critiquing. I remember I brought in the slide of a juvenile greater yellow eggs, and I was so proud of it. And they put it up, and Milton said, well, that's very nice. It's sharp, and you got the right exposure, which was completely 100% luck at the time. Uh -huh. He said, but why did you put the bird in the middle? And I said, well, where are you supposed to put the bird? <laughs> and he said, not in the middle. Because so you didn't have the composition. Well, we, I didn't know anything. I put the bird right. in the middle because it was easier to focus in the middle. Right, okay. So, what, you know, today, so, you know, I'm familiar with the Canon system. People want to, why don't you talk about Nikon? Well, I talk about what I know. I've been using Canon since, since, you started. since I started. Right. Today, you can go out and get a 7D2 and a 100 to 400 for well under 4,000 bucks and go out and make unbelievable pictures if you know what you're doing. So I started mentioning BPN. I forgot. I went okay. off on a tangent. We have a Canadian guy there, a young man named Daniel Cadio. Okay. For years, he owned the 100 to 400, the old one. Uh-huh. Uh-oh. Uh online, oh, the worst crap. It's not sharp. Blah, 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 blah. And a 7D. Oh, my God, the worst digital camera ever made. <laughs> Only problem was, guess what? He was good. Dan made great pictures. He I did a blog good. post. People can go to my blog and do a search for Daniel Cadio. How do you spell Cadio? C A D I E U X. Okay. And find the blog post with his images made with the old 100 to 407D. Now Dan's moved up to a 7D too. Uh -huh. 
What do the internet experts say? Don't use that camera over ISO 400. It's the worst piece of crap in the world. Well, Dan got rid of his 100 to 400, and he brought the 502. He hand holds it all. He uses the 72. His pictures are amazing. I just emailed him yesterday. We're going to do a blog post featuring his ISO 800 and 1600 images with the 72. And they're unbelievable. Uh -huh. So again, people just get so hung up on gear. They do. And they just want to spend their money every second, which is good for me because, you know, I talk about the new gear. Mm -hmm. I'm blessed to be able to own whatever the hell I want to own and buy it tomorrow. I, my, 1D Mark 5, my 5D Mark IV is coming on Monday. Ooh, that's exciting. And I'll, and I'll be taking some pictures and promoting it. And one of the, you know, we talk about, well, how do you make money? About four years ago, I, I became a B&H affiliate. Okay. So. And let me just stop you. If you're not familiar with B&H, it's one of the largest camera stores in the world, probably, right? It's not in one of. Is, it is the largest. The largest reta camera retailer, retail. audio, video, unbelievable. It, if you come to New York, just go to the store to be in like a museum. It's unbelievable. And the funny part is, I used to go to B&H when I first started to buy film. Mm -hmm. It was in a little tiny room, like about as big as your living room in, the, in this dining room. And there would be like 500 people there. Oh my gosh. And of course, it's all Hasidim, uh -huh. Orthodox Jews with the payas and the black, the black yeah. suits. And what you had to do was just elbow people and push them out of the way to get up near the counter wow. until you finally would get waited on. So they were that popular even when they oh. started. Oh, yeah. So now they moved into this huge, huge, huge. I don't know how many hundred thousand square feet and have orderly lines and they have tons of help. We'll come back to that in a second. And the coolest thing is, let's say you go and you buy a 600 millimeter F4 LIS2 lens and two 1DX bodies. Okay. The guy takes that physically and he puts it in this big bucket, this big plastic bucket thing. And then they put your receipt in there with your two camera bodies. Mm -hmm. And then you watch as it goes on this uh, opaque, not opaque, translucent conveyor belt. And you watch it go all around the store down to the cash register. Now, I've never been there, but I've seen a video. So you can see a yeah. video on YouTube if you want. <laughs> and B&H is kindly supplying the door prizes for the DPI SIG event tomorrow. Oh, okay. $100 gift certificate and 250s. Ooh, and it's a door prize? Door prize. Just show up. Maybe you win. <laughs> hey, if they ask me to pull it out. Yeah. You, you could give me the thing beforehand. I'll, 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 just, I'll bend it. We'll be in trouble now if you win. <laughs> All right, so we've got to we got to get back on track here. We do have so to, gear. I, okay, I, it doesn't matter. Everything digital is so good. If you learn how to use it, you can make great pictures. What do I use? What do you use? A whole bunch of stuff. The 600 millimeter f/4, the light version. I also own the 500. We'll talk about that when we get into the old folks question. Okay. I own the 400 do2. I just sold my 300 282. I just sold it used. I love the 100 to 400, the new, the new one. Oh my God. You can stand up and focus within one meter. So you can stand and photograph your own toenail Seriously? full frame. Wow. So I love it for its, for its, its versatility. Right. And then I own a bunch of other stuff and a bunch of other stuff. What's your main body? Right now, I can't even answer that question. You just, I mean, I've been you using, so many? No, I've been using, <laughs> I've been using two 5D SRs, the mega megapixel oh, monsters, wow. 51 megapixel right. capture. But everybody's hot for the the uh, the 1DX Mark II. 14 ridiculous frames per second and right. killer autofocus. Okay. So there's a big debate. So what I try to do, and I have a blog post coming up in a couple of days, people I just I I got two emails. What should I get, the 5D Mark IV or the 1DX2? And I go, listen, I'm trying to educate you about the camera. Here's a whole blog post on it. Here's another blog post. I'm getting the camera soon. I'll have pictures to share. But I can never tell you what you should get, what's worth it for you, what's right for you. You have to educate yourself about each camera. 
and make the decision. Okay. So my job is to try to educate, and I invite people to write. And then after I do this whole blog post saying just that, mm -hmm. I get another guy today tells me, <laughs> what should I get? Just tell me what to buy. <laughs> so but what I do, and here's part of the beauty, okay. when I became a B&H affiliate, if you want to buy a new lens, and I can convince you, mm -hmm. by hook or by crook, to click on my, lens, on my link on my blog, or click on the generic link on the upper right, and you spend however much money, I'll eventually get a check for 3.5%, as long as you do a web order. Right, and they don't charge any more. They pay get the paid same, exactly no the same thing, right. yeah. So, so, so support Artie's blog. It's been really a part-time job. So how can you do the blog every day for 366 days yeah, and 302 which, days? Hold on, I got a, I got a back story that because maybe they don't know. Artie blogs every single day. Almost. Almost? I thought you did every day. He calls well, him. right now, the longest streak ever was 366. So he calls this the streak. A leap, a leap, year, <laughs> a leap year plus one day. But now, and this is the first time this will be ever said in public, these words will be spoken. Okay. Right now, I'm going to South America on October 12th for nine and a half weeks. Wow. Much of that will be without internet. Oh, wow. But Mr. Insanity has been doing three and four blog posts a day. Right now, I'm 22 ahead. Oh, my If God. I can get 66 ahead or close in a month... It's like laying the groundwork for trying to do a blog post every day for the rest of my life. Oh my gosh. No, that, I'm so impressed I can't even get over it. Now, how do you come up with the topics? That's so easy. I saw that on your question list. I just go to a day folder or a trip folder and look at the pictures. And for every single picture, I can come up with eight lessons and make a blog post yeah. on it. So I'll pick the most interesting ones. Well, you have training as a teacher, and then you've been teaching photography for how many, 30 years? I used to get so pissed when I taught, because we had a guy named Joe Damiano who used to seriously come in and have the kids copy the phone book. That's, you mean just by just rote, Just busy basically. work. Yeah. Busy work. And the assistant principal would want to know, Artie, where's your lesson plans? And I would say, listen, a good teacher can walk in at 840, write one word on the board, and teach the hell out of these kids until 3 o'clock without even batting an eyelash. And they'll learn. And they'll learn a tremendous amount. Oh, my God. I try to keep the blog personal. I put something in the other day. <clears throat> I got an email. Dear Mr. Morris, it's Silma Cortez Vasquez. Do you remember me? I'm trying to find out if it's you. Did you oh, I read that in Did your you book. have me in fourth grade? Yeah, 39 years ago, Selma. And we, we talked on the phone, and we, we emailed, and she sent me pictures of her family. And, she, and she said, Mr. Morris, you need to know that your kindness to me in fourth grade changed my life. And when I was 17, I ran away from my abusive father. Not sexually abusive, but just... Right. Mean. abusive here and mm -hmm. I took care of myself and now I make a living as in uh, as a radiologist radiologist tech and I have a wonderful husband and three wonderful kids thanks to you oh my god and I've, I, over the years I've spoken to a bunch of them oh that's good and then it ties into the blog and the instructional photo tours and what keeps you going you know seeing my students succeed I have a bunch of won BBC prizes Wow. Clemens van der Werf, another explorer, Ani van der Waal, who photographed sails boats with Clemens, said, hey, if you want to learn photography, go on one of these trips with Artie Morris. He's an explorer. And Clemens said, I don't want to do birds. I like photographing my dogs and the sailboats. He said, it doesn't matter. The principles are all the same. Just go on a trip. So Clemens came on one IPT. Mm -hmm. Fell in love with birds. Now he has a bunch of nature's best prizes and a BBC prize. Oh my gosh, and, and he didn't even want to mm, take pictures of birds. And, and it's nice to see 
When I look at Clemens pictures, I see my work. You know, clean, tight, graphic, distant backgrounds. Uh -huh. So and a lot by of people. The way, IPT stands for in person training. No. No? Burgess Art IPT instructional photo tour. Dang, I was wrong. But that's good what? too. I like that. <laughs> So we are covering all the topics in no order at all. I know. It's just like <laughs> But I do. I, I'm watching the time a little bit, so I do have to get some technical I have to get some technical questions in for you. I'll because shut up. we have quite a few. I'll tell you the biggest questions are about focusing. Now what focusing mode do you use? Do you recommend? Does it depend? Do you use AI Servo? Okay, I use autofocus ninety nine point nine percent of the time. Okay, so your lens is If the auto subject's focus. behind the grass, I turn it off and focus manually. Okay. And on rare occasion, like I was experimenting in the Galapagos with the 100 to 402 and the 2X, you don't have autofocus. On a tripod, focusing manually was easy. Okay. But basically, I'm relying on autofocus. My number one pet one is expand one sensor with, with four around it, the four assist points in Canon. Okay. And I use that 50, 60% of the time. All right. And I move the sensor around all the time. Oh, so you do? That, oh, absolutely. Okay, that, that was one of the know. questions. Do you leave it in what the middle I, or? What do I call it? Sen oh, se CSS, Central Sensor I Syndrome. Central, oh, Central, so that's not good. No, they, <laughs> they just use the middle sensor and put the subject right in the middle every time. No, you got to move it out like Milton taught me the first day. Get the subject out of the middle. A lot of times you're going to do that by using, you know, by moving the sensor to the side. So one of the, because I love to work clean, tight, and graphic. Okay. I'm forever using the big lenses, the 500 or the 600 or even the 400 DO with a 2X teleconverter. Oh, okay. And there's lots of people who will tell you you can't make a sharp picture with the 2X teleconverter. And I say, well, how does this look? And I've been doing that. I say, if you can't make a sharp picture at a 60th of a second at 1,200 millimeters, then you're doing something wrong with your technique. Ah, Anybody can do it. Really? This takes a little practice. So. Did you say 60? 1 60th. Oh, 1 60th. 1 60th. Wow. I've even made sharp pictures. Not every time, but I've made sharp pictures with an 800 at a third of a second, which is ridiculous. But I can't, that was a freak. Okay, I was gonna but the, say. But, the, but the point, one of the things I wanted to say is, with the new 1DX2, yeah. and with the 5D Mark IV, you're gonna have the ability, when you're at F8, for years with Canon, when we use the 600 lens with the 2X, okay. F4 goes to F8, uh -huh. they would only give you the middle AF point, Okay and the four surrounding, but you couldn't move the sensor. So that really limited you. limited you and you had to really put your brains on, well, I can't focus on the duck's face because I'm going to cut his tail off. So I'm going to focus on his upper back, just this side of the center line to be on the same plane as the eye. Oh. But now with the 1DX Mark II and the 5D4, they're giving us all AF area selection modes and all the AF points uh, now how fast, at F8. How fast are you at changing those selection points? Not fast enough, but I'm okay. Yeah? Do you feel like that's a skill that people really need to practice? Oh, absolutely. The more you practice, the, more, the better you're going to get. All right. What, <laughs> a, what about back button focus? That's a big, it's a big trend right now. Okay. I'll give you my history on back button focus in a minute and a half. Okay. I use shutter button forever, like everybody else. Right. And then I learned back button focus. And in the beginning, I said, well, I'm going to use back button focus. But when birds are flying, I'm going to go to shutter button focus because it makes more sense. Okay. And then I used to write on the blog jokingly, that plan isn't working. I think I need psychiatric help. I was going to say, how could you remember which time? So then I went to rear focus full time. Okay. And for about six or seven years, I was using rear button focus. And I'd move tutorials. They're on the blog every other day. How to do it, what they mean, da, da, da. And then about a year and a half ago, I started saying, man, if I'm doing all flight, if I'm going on the Gannett boat, 
and after a half hour no one can lift their lens, why should I be doing two things if I could just press the shutter button? So I said, I'm doing it. I'll get over the psychiatric part. So when I'm in an action situation or I'm doing birds in flight, pure flight, I'm using the shutter button. And then when the bird's on the ground, it's just one click of the cue button, one click and switch one setting and I'm back in the room. And you find out very quickly when, you're, when you think you're in shutter button I, I and you're not. I'm that you can do that. Now tell, tell, in case people aren't familiar, what's the benefit of back button? Oh, the be okay, the ben you asked about AI servo AF. Okay. The beauty of rear button focus uh -huh. is that you put your camera in an AI servo for tracking. Mm -hmm. Which is AFC on a Nikon. AFC and that is continuous, mm -hmm. okay? And this works exactly the same for Nikon. You put it on AFC or continuous or in Canon, you put it on AI servo and you never take it off. Okay. So now you say, well, what do you do if you have a small in the frame bird and you want to put it in the corner? Right. You use rear button focus to set the focus. Uh-huh. Best to be on a tripod. Then you, rec you let go of the button okay. and you press the shutter button to take the picture. Focus is not going to change. Right, so it locks the focus. It sets the focus. It sets the focus. Locks implies that you've got to hold it. Okay. You don't. Now, if the bird starts to run or fly, you just put the, push the button and hold it. So it gives you one shot by focusing, releasing, and recomposing and taking the pictures. Mm -hmm. Here comes a great bird. Hold the shutter button in and take the pictures. So, so that's the huge advantage. No going back and forth from one shot. Right, I see. To servo. And that becomes four times more important when you're stuck with the middle AF point only. Oh, right. That makes sense. So, yeah, I do it now. Probably, if I'm photographing every day, maybe once in a week I'll screw up. Wow. One of the worst ones, I was at Alifaya Banks and... This Boonville came running at me, and I just went, shh, and I was in rear button. Oh. So you're going to get burned once in a while, but for me, the advantages are great. Wow. Now, see, I, I don't use the rear button, but Joe does, and so every time I pick up his camera, I'm like, I can't focus it, because <laughs> I forget. <laughs> As a tour leader, one of my favorite questions, my camera's not focusing. So, you know, having done it for 33 years, you pick the camera up. And it's generally one of three things, which are all like, duh. So what are the, the number things? one cause? The AF switch is set to M. Oh, yeah. So that's on the lens. On the lens. Or they have rear focus set and not shutter button or vice versa. And then there's a really fancy one with Canon uh, that I use only rarely. Okay. Turn autofocus search off. And I write about it, and when I write about it in, in the follow-up, uh -huh. The Art of Bird Photography 2 on CD, oh, you do? Okay. 986 page, 916 pages, 900 photographs. So this is a... This is the follow-up. E basically. This is the e-book follow-up. Now we'll come back to another question. So this is, this is right. number one. This is all film with the basics. But we've got to watch the glare. This is all film with basics. Then I started writing this book. I was going to do a second book. Uh-huh. When I got up to 916 pages, I said, this would be this no thing. one could carry it. <laughs> but then it, it opened up this whole new world of self-publishing in digital form. So this whole concept of selling information either on a CD okay. or in a PDF via email uh -huh. is 50% of the reason that I am not a greeter at Walmart. <laughs> You know and what? I'm talking serious money. I have a file called Digital Basics. Okay. I haven't updated it in about three or four years because I pretty much had all the tricks in there with the zillion Photoshop tricks and my, my workflow. I built a swimming pool in my backyard four years ago for $68,000. Digital Basics was then 20 bucks. Okay. It paid for the whole swimming pool. Wow. So there's serious money. I wrote and a, that was a download, a digital a download? download, yeah. Okay. I wrote a 7D Mark II guide 
when the camera first got out. I got it, I banged away at it for a month or two. Mm -hmm. I wrote a guide to autofocus settings, how to use it, blah, 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 nothing on video. And it was a tremendous amount of work because the 7D was like a new breed camera. Okay. Where everything was new. We sold some ridiculous number. And it was... You know, like seventy, now, eighty thousand okay. dollars worth in a year. So, wait, let me just see what else, because uh, I have a, a lot of people ask about the business of photography. How do you, if you want to be a nature photographer, okay, first question, should you specialize? You obviously have succeeded quite well specializing in bird photography. My answer is simple. Photograph what you love. Ah. If you love everything, photograph everything. But, okay, so I love, I, let's say I love, um, I can't think of anything, <laughs> like landscape photography. Okay. And I have a great collection of land. I've got a hundred award-winning, fabulous photo, photos. I mean, I've, everybody says so. I've won all these awards. But I'm not making any money. What do I, what should I do? I cracked up when I read that question. <laughs> I, I get wanted that question to, a lot from I people. wanted to say, okay, you got a hundred. Not enough. Make another nine hundred ninety-nine thousand. But here's the point: even if you have a hundred thousand potentially contest-winning images, uh -huh. it has nothing to do with being a professional photographer. Okay. Especially in today's climate. Remember, we talked about two thousand one and selling two hundred twenty thousand dollars worth of picture. Right. And now selling less than twenty thousand, even though I'm way more skilled. Yeah. Because the markets have gone down. Some of my friends, Daryl Goulin, great stock photographer. He still makes money, but a fraction. Oh right, stock photography. It's so of what cheap he made. to buy it now. So, photograph what you love, and then find. You have to have a creative mind to find either markets for your work or your skills. Okay. So, even five, eight, ten years ago, when I used to go to NAMP, I don't anymore. And young kids would go up to other professionals and say, I want to be a professional photographer in nature. What should I do? And they'd say, be a teacher, get a job in Walmart, study computers. Okay, yeah. And I would say, no, that's what they're going to tell you. But if you love it and you have half a brain and you can figure out markets for your work, I say, you got to teach. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody today who doesn't teach. Right, everybody teaches and does you know, workshops. Use my, you know, doing right. workshops, selling information in digital form. You know, that, nobody did that 10 years ago. Right. I mean, I sort of led the league in that, in making serious money. Uh -huh. And then a lot of po folks have followed along, and some of them, uh, there's a guy who's an explorer, William O'Neill. Mm -hmm. I remember telling him, yeah, Bill, I'm making gobs of money. <laughs> selling CDs with, with images and how-to stuff. Uh -huh. Man, he undercut me. <laughs> no, not, not the same topics, but he'll, uh, you know, you can get a CD with like his favorite 100 images in a story for like 12 bucks. Oh, wow. But he's selling eight gazillion of them. Oh, wow. My old father used to say, buy a stamp for a nickel today and sell it for a dime tomorrow and you'll be a rich man. Oh, wow. So... Selling. Speaking of my father, I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna go off topic again. I'm okay. We're so That's bad. Okay. Everybody asks, what drives you? What inspires you? How could you be so stupid to do a blog post every day? <laughs> I don't think stupid is the right word, but go you know, ahead. <laughs> the record was 366. Right now I'm up to 303. Oh boy. But the plan that I have is that I would do one every day for the, for the rest of my life. Oh my gosh, that just blows my mind. So, what drives you? When my dad. He was mortally injured, not mortally, I guess that's the wrong word. He was almost killed in Okinawa. He was hit 17 times. He lost his right arm. His left elbow was hang, hanging by a thread, 19 months in the hospital. And like a typical World War II son, my father never hugged me once. He never said one nice thing about me. When he said, you got 99 on the test, that's bull. What happened to the other point? He wasn't making a joke. Oh, wow. He was being deadly serious. So he was so, hard on you. So he was hard on me. But that's typical. Tom Brokaw's book and the whole bit. So
lung cancer, throat cancer, massive heart attack, two killer pneumonias. The, second pneumo the first pneumonia, my mother went to the hospital and they said, kiss Bob goodbye, he's not going to survive the night. That was on Monday. Then on Wednesday, they said, well, you really better go kiss him goodbye tonight because we're taking him off life support and he's going to die tonight for sure. And two weeks later, he was home busting my mother's balls. Oh, my gosh. Jesus. So they just fought, fought, fought. But the thing is, near the end, I said, geez, I better write my dad this email. You know, uh -huh. the letter. Uh-huh. What's the letter? The Tell letter. Us. You know, the getting the stuff off your chest, the whole lifetime of hurt. Wow. You know, or so whatever. So you did that? So I wrote the letter, and I said to my sister, Arna, read this to Daddy, will you? Now, I know if I had read it to my father in person or said those words, he would have got up and smacked me backhanded with his, with his one arm. And the letter went something like, Dear Dad, I'm writing this note to thank you for being the meanest son of a bitch in the world, for never saying one nice thing about me in my entire life. Wow. Because, because of you... And who you were, I know you were doing your best, and I know that you loved me. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a boy named Sue. Right. That's I fine. said, I said, when I was 13 and 14 and 15, I, I tried my best to be the best bowler in the world. And when I was in my teens and lung 20s, I tried to be the best golfer I could be. I practiced till my hands bled. And you were trying to please him. I was trying to get people to say the nice things about me that you never said. And that went on, you know, people go, oh, Mr. Famous Bird Photography now. And I go, hey, listen, you could, you could think this is bull ego or you could buy it as fact. But when I taught elementary school, I was a much better teacher than I am a bird photographer today. I did great things in the classroom and I'm proud of it. And then to get these little rewards, I spoke to Joylene John. She went to Brown on a medical scholarship. She was in my ghetto class. Oh, wow. She was brilliant. I spoke to her and I said, Joylene, she was this tall black girl, just like an African princess. I said, Joylene, I want you to know, when I had you in sixth grade, you intimidated me. <laughs> she never laughed so hard in her life. Oh, well, she's it's probably great bigger than you, huh? <laughs> it's, it's great reconnecting. And, oh, that is great. And, you know, and I, you know, I know we're hitting different questions. I, I do the blog because I love to share and I love to teach. And do I make money from it? Yeah, we try to keep most of it subliminal. It, it drives the tour business. Now, do it, you love doing the tours? I mean, do you like, this is what you this is really probably like the, to do? Or? This is probably the sickest thing that will ever be said. I, God bless this new Understanding Photography live broadcast. <laughs> You'll probably never hear a sicker thing than this. Okay. Every professional nature photographer who I'm aware of, who I know, and I have zillions of them as friends, if you said to them, would you rather go out on a secluded beach by yourself or with six people who are going to be asking you questions? What do they say? And they, everyone would say, put me on the beach, get these people the hell out of here. <laughs> and I'm going, no brainer. I want to go out with six people. You do. You love I'm it. I'm a people person. I love being around people. And you're a teacher. I, I love being in the center of attention. I mean, let's call the spade a spade. Why do I do the blog? For attention. Comes back to the stuff with my dad. And there's a great book called Seeing Your Life Through New Eyes. Okay. Paul Brenner, I believe, is the guy. He's a Canadian psychologist. Uh -huh. And I went to that book at the suggestion of my dear friend Cliff Oliver. And you'll find out tomorrow that without Cliff in my life, I'd have been long dead. I was overweight oh, wow. and heavy and AFib and high blood pressure. Oh, wow. You look great <clears throat> and, now. Well, a little fat. But <laughs> Cl Cliff got me on the straight and narrow, and he suggested I get this book. And this is the book when I read it and I did, this, did the, the worksheets and talked to my sister that I realized that my father did love me. Wow. So it's great stuff. Seeing your, your life through new eyes. Paul Brenner. We'll have that in the I show believe. notes on understandphotography.com as well. Understand life. And I can't even talk about my life without mentioning Byron Katie. Okay. Thework.com amazing woman who teaches us to love what is and be at peace. So you can be pissed off at whatever you want. Is this already ever going to shut up? <laughs> go, to, go to her website, download the worksheet, thework.com, do the work, ask four questions, turn it around, find peace. With Elaine's death, for seven years, 
I, I actively chose to play the role of martyr. And somebody would say, oh, you're Arthur Morris, you're famous, Birds is art. And I'd go, yeah, but the one person who loved me is dead, and I'd start sobbing after seven years. Oh, wow. And when I found the work, and I did the work on Elaine's death, now I can look back and think of how great it was. Really? And now we have to take a break and go back a tiny bit to Burge's art. Yes, okay. Where the hell did that come Where from? Where the hell did that come from? <laughs> 1988 or 9, and thinking about leaving teaching, mm -hmm. and then you need a name for my business. And boy, oh boy, you look at all the websites, images of nature's, nature's images, the images of nature's reflections, nature's reflections. Jesus, who the hell is who? You don't even know the most famous one, Images of Nature. Do you know who that is? No. Tom Mangelson. Oh, wow. Be why not? Because all the names are the same. They sound the same. So Elaine and I are sitting there, and we're brainstorming. Well, you're Arthur, you're Artie, you like birds, you work as artistic. And she says, birds is art. That's perfect. I, I didn't said, even get that connection either I said, your name. How silly. <laughs> oh, it's that blonde hair. I guess so. <laughs> so I said, oh, my God, babe. And now it survives her every time I utter the words. Wow. She's and it's there. a perfect name, too. Birds is art. Birds is art. you got to love it. Now, we are going to start wrapping it up because it's, uh, we'll run out. Facebook Live doesn't give us a lot of time. They're going to shut us off whether we like it or not. And I want to hear what do you have coming up. Now, you said you're going to. Where are you going and for how long? Longest trip of my life. South America for nine weeks. Oh my gosh. I'll be spending a week, a couple of days in Santiago, Chile, a few days on the Falklands, a week on the Falklands, then going on a Cheeseman's Ecology Safari on their last ever South Georgia voyage. Then I'll be hanging for three weeks or in different places in South America, and then back to the Falklands for, uh, for another two weeks with, now, a these, with a group. Okay, some of these are workshops and some of them well, are on your own? or. I'll be making some bucks. As some of them are, one of the stories is very complex and I can't talk about it. Okay. But I'll come out ahead. A little, a little of everything though you're doing. Yeah, a lot of vacationing. Wow. And vacationing, guess what that is? Going out and taking pictures. Getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and home <laughs> photographing. My mother says to me, so do you go, well people ask me, women, if I go on a date, so do you go on a vacation without a camera and a lens? So why the hell would anyone do that? That's the stupidest I can't thing imagine. I ever heard. <laughs> you would just feel so empty. <laughs> hey, do you want to take two seconds and go over the tips? Oh, yes. Okay, top 10 tips. Top 10 tips. Here we go. The top 10 tips for bird photographies, photographers. What are your top 10 tips for becoming a great bird photographer? Work hard and study, but don't waste your time unless you really love it. Get out early and stay out late. Get low and move slowly. Study your subjects and learn everything you can about their biology and habits. And the best way to do that is not from a book. Really? Go out and watch them. Oh, okay. I've been doing that for 33 years. Point your shadow at the subject. When it's a clear day, I'm going to strive to get right on my shadow line. I do not like side light. 10 or 15 degrees, you can work with if the bird turns his head right. But when I go to the alligator farm and I'm seeing shoot people photographing this way and this way and their shadows that way, I go, just delete them all. You're wasting your time. So the light should be right on the bird. Sun behind you. Okay. Now, if you're shooting silhouettes right. or backlight, now you want the opposite situation. On a clear day, you want photographer, subject, sun behind you. Okay. When you're doing silhouettes or backlight, you still want the, everything on the same 180 degree line, just in a different order. Behind the Photographer, behind subject, sun. Okay. Then you're going to get the, the strongest silhouette effect and the effect in the prettiest colors. Look at as many great images as you can. And study them. God. Just, there's so many online sites, so many books I used to just go. I have a, I have a wall. I built a, I built a library when we redid my house about six or seven years ago. And it's just filled with books with great pictures. Just look at them, studying them. Studying. Get involved in birdphotographers.net. That sounds like a there's great no idea. There's no better way to learn how to make better pictures than to critique other po people's pictures. 
and have folks comment on your pictures. And let me just stop you. That will be that website will be on in the show notes. Go ahead. Get on as many of my Burgess Art instructional photo tours as you can. And if, how many tours do you do a year? A dozen on average. Wow. Fastest way to start them. Travel to great places. You look at the BBC contest. You look at Nature's Best. There's snow monkeys in there every year. There's stellar sea eagles. There's stuff from the Galapagos. Ah, there's, you don't see just the regular old seagulls. You do see that. How about pigeons? You do see it. Don't get me started. Okay. <laughs> and then back to the top of the list. Work hard and study. If you want it, you can do it. If you're going to be a crybaby, forget it. Top five mistakes amateurs make. Six and then one more on top. Not paying attention to sun angle. Oh. It just kills me. I want to go out and smack these people. <laughs> the bird's there and your shadow is pointing over there. Get a life. The, it's not going to be good. You know, one in a thousand. One in, I have in my entire collection of a couple hundred thousand digital images, I have like four side lid Im images of birds that I like. Wow. Wow. So. Not very many. Go ahead. On the same vein, being oblivious to what makes a good situation, okay. looking at the background, the biggest single factor is to learn to see the situations where the background's far from the bird. Okay. Then you can get the pure color, which okay. is, of course, my style. Uh, but I just see people shooting, and I'm looking for a half hour, and I walk right behind them, and they're pointing at a bird, and I'm going, what in the world could they possibly be doing or thinking? Join the tour. Get your butt on the ground. Simplest way to move the background farther from the bird. If the bird's totally tame and you walk up to it with a 300, you're shooting down. Whatever dirt is on the dirt, you're going to see it. Right. But if you lay flat down on the ground, now the background's 300 yards away, and it's beautiful. Oh, okay. Get your butt on yeah. the ground. Yeah. And then all those, oh, use a tripod. People just think they can handhold it any shutter speed. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of incredibly talented young folks who are amazing. Patrick Sparkman, my friend, handholds the 600 with the 2X, makes razor sharp pictures. Wow. But it's right. Arash, Arash Hazegi, there's a blog, blog post two weeks ago, shooting the 400 DO and the 600 handholding. A peregrine falcon, the fastest bird in the world, just pictures make you faint. Oh my gosh. All right. And, so then, and then that thing about give up this idea that you're going to buy a great camera and be a great photographer. Give that up. Give it up. Learn, Learn to, to use what you got with the stuff that you got. Study. Look at the great pictures. And then I forgot the last one that I put in extra. I'm done. <laughs> well, if, if, if you're here in Southwest Florida, do not miss Artie tomorrow. He'll be at Florida Southwestern College from 9 to noon. Um, and you'll see, we'll put the link in the Understand Photography show notes on our website. Okay, so we got one more thing. If you're not in Southwest Florida, hop on a plane. Come on down. You got to hurry, though, because yeah, it's, it's tomorrow, tomorrow. morning. <laughs> anyway. Now, now, where can everybody find your schedule? Oh, the most important thing we need, I mentioned it a few times. I like to say the blog is the bomb. Okay. Every single thing we talked about, plus tons of stuff we didn't talk about, they can go to the blog, and there's a, aside from free education every day for okay. 303 days in a row, uh -huh. tomorrow I think will be 303, aside from that, they can sell their used gear. They can visit the Burgess Art Store. I have an online store. That's another way I make money. Which is, by the way, where his books are sold. Go ahead. You can get all the books and educational stuff. We've got tripod accessories. We've got Wimbley stuff. We've got Mongo stuff. We only sell what I use. I'm not going to sell you junk. There's lots of competitive sites that carry every brand of tripod and every brand of head and, every, and they will sell you the worst crap. They, I will show you what's the best crap and how to use it. <laughs> so, and, you know, and we have people, so they, they the write for advice who, and they ignore me, but that's... But the people who are wondering what type of equipment to buy, it's all there on your blog. 
on every blog post, the first thing is what's up. That's a couple of sentences of personal. Uh -huh. Then right on the night that it says, please, please, please don't go to the idiots at your camera store and ask about equipment, for long lenses for nature photographer. Write me an email. And then once they write me an email, then I'm 50% way of that to get them to click on my B&H link. Yeah. and fund my, my, my part-time job. Well, you know, that was one of our questions, and I am going to have to cut short. Um, but if you're looking for advice on something, the best place to go is to the expert. If you need advice uh -huh. on bird photography, don't go to the camera store. Go to the expert. As okay. much as I love my friends at B&H, and they've been wonderful to me, I called up B&H, and they said, get that. And I go, oh, God. One little quick thing that we, one major thing that I think we missed, you're getting older, the lenses keep getting heavier, the true. distances keep getting longer. There's lighter lenses. I mentioned I own the 600 and the 500. Uh -huh. I love the 600. I'm going to South America with the 500. Because it was It's just less? too big of a bear. Uh -huh. it, t it takes up so much room in your case, you can't bring anything else. So the 500. Grin and Barrett, and then Canon has these great options. Even Nikon, finally, with their 600 lens, they finally made one that weighed less than three and a half tons. Of course, it costs three and a half million dollars, but... Now, is this a blog article? Because we're going to get cut off. We're good. Okay. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Uh, thank you it's so much great. for coming. <laughs> I'm sorry that I never shut up, but I guess that's a good thing that in an interview. That is a good thing. I think it was interesting. And you know what? Artie blogs every single day, and you really feel like you get to know him if you read the blog every day. And there is so much information. All right, this is the Understand Photography Show, and we are wrapping it up. Thank you for coming for our first live show. Next week's show is all going to be about traveling and preparing to travel. We'll give both photography tips and just general travel tips. So watch us live on Fridays at 4 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. And I will do a blog post with the unanswered questions. Ooh, bonus. Thanks again. It was great. Thank you. Bye, boys and girls. Get up.